Uh, thanks, Lee, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my fellow speakers. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I've um, lived the whole of my life in Northern Australia, in fact, far north Queensland. Uh, the, um, I hate to say it, Sandra, but the, I've always seen the Tropic of Capricorn as down south. Uh, and um, what I propose to do today, well, I'm speaking today as chairman of IFED. IFED is, uh, is a uh, new company, uh, Integrated Food and Energy Developments. And to talk about the proposal that, um, that we have for developing Northern Australia. It's called the Etheridge Integrated Agricultural Project. Um, very important, the next line that you have there, a greenfield development of a privately funded, we're not looking for government money, large scale, world class, vertically integrated and sustainable agribusiness. Our proposal is in fact to bring government policy to life because green papers and white papers are helpful but they don't create any economic development. Um, this is the area that we're talking about. Uh, if I can point, it's easier for me to point this way. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can see Cairns up there, and this is the Gulf over here, Normanton and Corumba. So we're, we're proposing our project for about halfway in between. It's called the Gilbert River System, and this is the Gilbert River. The Ainsley River runs into it, and the Etheridge, and that's called the Etheridge Shire, that's the Etheridge in the middle there. Um, you can see it's a fairly big river system in terms of outflow, 5.4 million uh, megalitres. Uh, the Ord River is 3.87 million megalitres. Uh, we've, these properties here, we've put an option, we've got an option on five properties totaling 326,000 hectares. Uh, we're proposing 65,000 hectares of irrigated cropping. Our water storage is going to take up 18,000 18, hectares and we'll have 2,000 hectares of processing infrastructure. So that's just the snapshot. We talk about integrated and we talk about scale and that's fundamental to why this one works. Uh, I'll come back and talk a bit more about the water storage in a minute, but... Bloody thing, I, oh, there we are. Uh, we've got, uh, our water storage is off river, uh, not the traditional dams in river and I'll speak about that in a minute. Um, we're, pro we're proposing to use mostly, I mean the objective was down here, uh, it is for irrigated farming, 40,000 hectares of sugarcane and 25,000 hectares of guar. Just quickly, guar is a legume. Um, it's, uh, it, it has been manufactured. It's, it's more of a subcontinent uh, product. Uh, it's used for food thickening, and uh, you've seen it. It's in toothpaste. It's in, in a million products that you use. But it's got a special application these days in coal seam fracking or shale gas fracking because it's injected with the water and, and, and serves the purpose of holding it apart. So it's got a long, secure future, we believe. Um, across here, we'll have a sugar mill, which will produce, uh, well, we're going to produce 4.8 million tonnes of cane a year. Uh, that will produce, in a sugar mill, 662,000 tonnes of sugar and 100,000 megalitres of Oh, sorry, and that will translate into raw sugar, sugar of 535,000 tonnes and 100 megalitres of ethanol. Um, also, we will then utilise the um, waste from that in a cogen, which will produce 90 mega, megawatts of electricity, about half of which we will consume on site and half of which we'll export into the grid. Uh, the um, gua, there will be a gum plant for the guar to produce guar gum. And then all of the um, waste products from the sugar mill, uh, from the, le this is the legume, incidentally, uh, the bagasse coming from the sugar, the cane tops, uh, and the hull and germ from the, um, from the guar, we can produce 400,000 tonnes of stock feed. And because we can produce that, 
There are a million cattle in that particular region, but pretty disadvantaged, a long way from markets. Six months of the year they lose weight, uh, so it's hardly the most productive um, area in the world for cattle. But because we'll have 400,000 tonnes of stock feed, they won't have to lose that weight in the middle of the year anymore. That that justifies, because we'll be using our own electricity and we'll have 12 months supply of stock, then that justifies a basic meat processing plant, which will produce 53,000 tonnes of meat products per year. Um, so you can see fundamentally what we mean by integration, that the waste from one process becomes the feedstock for another process, and that's what underpins as well as the scale. Uh, just to go back to the uh, water storage, this is the same region. This is the Etheridge. This is, uh, sorry, this is the Etheridge. Um, that's the Ainsley, and this is the Gilbert River, and they all come together just down on the uh, the west side. So this is one of the Gulf rivers, but actually they actually flow from east to west rather than south to north. But one of those that was studied, one of the systems studied by in that recent study by CSIRO. Uh, we're proposing off-river storages. This is God, this topography is God-given for water storage. I kid you not. Uh, that particular off, uh, we will uh, we'll have an offtake here in the Etheridge River. That's uh, that storage there is 1.6 million. Uh, megalitres, about the size of Wyvano Dam. But the beauty of it is that it's about 14, it will average 14 metres deep, which is about twice the depth of most of the water storages in Queensland, the Burdigan Dam, what have you. And of course, that's very valuable in terms of minimising evaporation. Uh, we'll have a channel system that will take it to a 400,000 megalitre storage here, and we'll take a bit more water from the, or we're proposing to take a bit more water from the um, Etheridge River, and that's what feeds into the cropping area. Now, all of those um, green, yellow, red, and so forth, they are 40 hectare blocks of um, irrigated land. Uh, in fact, it looks fairly small looking at it there, but there's 1,250 40 hectare blocks of land, irrigated uh, land there. So that's fundamentally it. Um, as I said, this storage is at the base of the range and um, very large um, areas that with relatively simple um, uh, dams, if you like, um, we can store an enormous amount of water. Uh, just quickly, to see the scale of the whole, I, I won't go, go through all of those, but you can see that the capital expenditure is just on $2 billion. Now, when we're talking about an agricultural development of $2 billion, most people, their eyes roll a bit. Uh, but if you're talking a $2 billion uh, mining venture or coal seam gas, it's a bit ho-hum. And to a certain extent, we have taken a sort of a resources attitude uh, to this agricultural development, because that's what you've got to do if you're going to develop these things in remote, uh, re in remote re uh, regional Australia. Um, we've done a lot of work on those numbers there, and uh, we're very comfortable uh, with the costings. Uh, I mean, through a lot of engineering firms and what have you. Um, just quickly, and I won't go through this uh, in great detail, but our total revenue at this stage is proposed uh, of almost $900 million of a, and an EBITDA of $350 million. Um, again, we've done a lot of um, financial modelling and we're comfortable with this. Uh, there's an internal rate of return of something like 18 to 20%. Uh, which we believe will justify the major capital raising for construction. Sustainability, people always say, gee, something this big, what are you doing to the environment? Um, well, we think that this is the most sustainable of projects that it is possible to envisage. Uh, unlike extractive industries, it goes on forever. It doesn't run out, the resource doesn't run out. Uh, from the point of view of carbon sustainability, uh, we will operate completely on renewable energy. Uh, we uh, manufacture our own uh, electricity. And not only do we operate entirely on renewable energy, we export renewable energy into the grid. Uh, in terms of um, ethanol, we will produce, uh, or the, uh, the volume of, of ethanol that we produce 
equals about nine times of the liquid fuels that we will consume in this whole operation. Uh, so from a, uh, from a carbon point of view, we are very sustainable. Um, ecological sustainability, we are proposing to harvest just 10% of the total flow of the Gilbert River system. Uh, we will want, uh, we are proposing about 500 and, uh, 550,000 megalitres uh, per annum um, consumption, and that includes evaporation. And I, I pointed out in an earlier slide that um, the uh, average annual flow for the Gilbert River system is 5.4 million megalitres. Um, Off-river uh, off water storage is much more sustainable in our view than the traditional dams because off-river we harvest from the very big flows. Dams in the river take all the small flows and when by the time you get to the big flow that all goes downstream. And from maintaining the ecology of the river system we argue that off-river off is much more sustainable. Um, we, of course, will ensure that there's much less sediment loss. Uh, this country has been, uh, is, has been used for 100 years for cattle grazing and so forth, and they uh, have their own impact on the systems and the river systems in particular. Uh, we're using state-of-the-art trickle tape irrigation, or we propose to use it, uh, and so there will be, um, you know, in the precision application of nutrients and virtually no runoff at all and no nutrient runoff. Uh, and of course, because of the size of our um, operation, there, there will be much improved uh, pest and weed and, um, uh, and, and feral animal uh, controls in that particular part of the world, which is a major problem. Um, the Etheridge Shire is one of the most disadvantaged shires in Australia. It has uh, been classified so. In fact, the last figures we saw, the unemployment rate was 16.2%. Um, the Etheridge Integrated Agricultural Project, that's EIAP, uh, we propose to create 1,200 jobs direct. And of course, as you know, there'll be um, uh, a multiplier effect, effect on that. Uh, there will also be a, a, a massive impact on local businesses and many business opportunities. Uh, we will have, and we are determined to have, an indigenous employment program. We've been speaking to the traditional owners already, um, and um, we would make that part and parcel of, um, of our program. Uh, animal welfare outcomes, uh, I, made, I mentioned a while ago that the, uh, the cattle that are grown in that part of the world, they're a million miles from markets, they have long travelling distances in trucks and what have you. Um, and, uh, and if, they're, um, if, if it's live exports, of course, that's got its own issues. So local processing will eliminate that. And of course, the stock feed, the 400,000 tonnes of stock feed, will ensure that all of these cattle are better fed in the, uh, in the dry seasons and through the droughts. So it'll have uh, positive animal welfare outcomes. Uh, government and community benefits, I'm not sure I've got to go through all of those. Uh, the, um, the money going both to state and federal governments will go that way instead of that way because a disadvantaged shire with uh, you know, a lot of social spending and so forth, uh, that is now the case, uh, will not be the case into the future. So there'll be reduced social outlays, unemployment benefits and those sorts of things. Uh, and the payroll tax and the, uh, and the income tax and the company tax and what have you will be going back to the government. There will be positive impact on our, on our balance of trade uh, and a whole range of benefits to governments and certainly the local council, which is a very disadvantaged local council, uh, which is supporting our project um, uh, very, very strongly. Uh, obviously, it'll lead to um, improved community facilities and jobs, 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 which is uh, something very topical these days. Uh, just quickly, where are we now? Uh, we've negotiated those uh, option agreements with the five landowners. Uh, we've completed detailed technical and commercial feasibility analysis. Uh, we've signed a development protocol with the state government, which means so long as we go through the whole process and, and tick all the boxes in terms of environmental st uh, studies and so forth, that water will be made available. Uh, as I said, we've still got to go through the public approval process. Um, and the government has declared it a coordinated project, which used to be referred to as a project of state significance. 
uh, and that means the Coordinator General will coordinate the approval process. But I, I've got to stress that it's still got to go through that process and there'll be a public input part to that process. Um, and we're out in the market now um, uh, raising pre-construction capital, uh, capital to take it through that approval and take us to bankable feasibility. Okay, we've had these projects before. Uh, I won't go through them, but there's some that uh, come to mind and nearly always, well, have always. These massive projects that we're going to build in Northern Australia have virtually all failed. So what's different this time? Scale, I'll keep talking about scale, but to develop agriculture in isolated parts of Northern Australia, you need the scale to justify all of the processing infrastructure. If it's too small, I mean, if the government come back to us and said, well, you can do this, but you only half the size, it doesn't work. It's got to be big enough to have a sugar mill and to have its own, all the different processing plants. Um, so scale gives us the processing architecture. Economies of scale are all, always important themselves um, in, in every way, that because you can do things cheaper if you're large. Uh, it gives you market power, and market power goes both ways. It gives you market, you know, the story these days about uh, Coles and Woolworths and farmers not having the market power. If you're this large, you can look those kind of people in the eyes. But market power is also important when you're, uh, when you're um, looking for inputs, you know, uh, acquiring inputs, whether it's fertiliser or whatever it happens to be. Market power is very important. Uh, we're big enough to do, do our own in-house research. Uh, in the past, you know, when I was growing up, it was always the government did all the research and the extension and so forth. They are withdrawing from that increasingly. You've got to be big enough to do your own. Um, and we would have a strong capital base, which means that, you know, the droughts and so forth that were there in the past, uh, you, you can um, uh, tolerate those. Integration, there's two parts to the integration. I call that integration one. Um, but that is the farming and the processing is completely aligned. I mean, what went wrong in the ord is they built a sugar mill and then you had all of these small farmers and the water was separate again too and uh, they were variable and unreliable as suppliers to the sugar mill because they all had different objectives. Um, this is just the one farm and the one processing plant and uh, all of the uh, outcomes are perfectly aligned and absolutely essential to make it work. Integration too is what I spoke about before, um, the fact that um, the, the waste from one part of one process becomes the feedstock for another one. And it's just extraordinary um, the way in which they go together. I think I may have left out, I didn't go back up to the top before, but um, we're also, and this wasn't even part of our thinking, is we're looking at red claw or aquaculture. We've got all this water, red claw is a, is a small lobster, uh, which is native to this particular part of the world uh, and a great delicacy. And gee, the way in which it fits in is just quite extraordinary because um, uh, our bioprocessing treatment of our waste water uh, produces um, uh, nutrient which is very valuable in feeding fish, or particularly red claw, because it's, I understand it's not a protein based, it, it, it's a carbohydrate based um, um, animal. Um, and then the flip side of that is when they finished with the water, it's got added nutrients in it, which are very valuable for our um, farm. So in its own way, it's, it's potentially a, a very valuable add-on. It was something that somebody's come to us and said, have you thought about this? And we've, the more we look at it, uh, the better it looks. Um, but yes, um, it's still big and still ambitious. Off-the-shelf farming, I've got that. Uh, why do we grow sugar cane? Good question. Well, one of, the, one of the reasons we grow it, I mean, we looked at a lot of them and the gross margins and what have you. The beauty of sugar cane is um, the waste products and what we can do with them, you know, the generating of electricity, the cogen and what have you. But also the world knows that we in North Queensland can grow sugar. And when we're out in the capital markets raising funds, We'll say we're growing sugar and they will understand. And we've done all our numbers based on the Burdekin. It's very similar, but it's not that far from Marie Bidimbula either where there is a substantial um, sugarcane industry now since the tobacco industry has closed down. Um, so it's off the shelf farming. There's nothing new about growing sugar. 
uh, at this scale there is, but that makes it better. Uh, and off-the-shelf processing technology. I mean, sugar farms and, and, and abattoir, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, sugar mills and so forth, uh, they're there. We know how to build them. Um, we've, we know the people that do build them. So it's really off-the-shelf processing technology, uh, not a great lot of risk. The de-risking of weather, very important. You know, if you've been involved in the agricultural game, those weather cycles and um, commodity price cycles uh, are something that you've just got to face up to. Well, we've effectively taken the weather cycle out of it because we propose to store four times the, um, uh, the water that we require on an annual basis. And we've looked at 100 years of rainfall reports and we would never have missed a crop in that 100 years. But, and the flip side is, where all the sugar's grown in Queensland, in the cyclone belt, we're far enough inland not to be, uh, uh, have problems with, uh, with cyclones. So we've almost taken the weather equ equation uh, um, out, out of it, which is pretty unusual in an agricultural process. Um, the innovative water storage, um, We've found that we can store three times as much water at half the cost as traditional in-river storage and much more um, ecologically sustainable as well. And I put that last one down, sunshine, soil and water. Uh, we forget sunshine sometimes as an important ingredient in agriculture. Now sunshine of course can be a nuisance if you haven't got water, but if you've got water, if you've got sunshine and you've got soil, uh, and the CSIRO report said there's plenty of, soil, plenty of all of those, uh, then that's the stuff of agriculture. CSIRO report, um, we got a fair bit of negative um, comments because people read that very quickly and sort of said, well, uh, you know, that proves there's not enough land and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the numbers don't stack up. But really, um, uh, that, that particular, that's the Flinders and Gilbert River assessments that Peter spoke about before. Uh, they analysed what we call the old model, in-river water storages. Um, the business model, they just looked at the smaller scale and pre-farm gate, not processing. Uh, and the separation of um, the water, the farming and the processing. And they proved it didn't work. We knew it didn't work. Uh, you've got to do it different. Uh, as I said, if we keep doing what we always did, we'll get what we always got. Um, but it was a great report, so I don't want to sound like I'm negative about it because um, uh, this whole of river catchment uh, analysis which they've done is absolutely invaluable to us and all of the information there is, is absolutely valuable. Water allocation is the crux of it all. We've got to determine, and we've been saying this to government, and I think they, they understand it, but um, do we allocate water to deliver the maximum economic benefit and jobs per megalitre? Um, I had a number here, um, which we'd worked out, that um, the, our income is $1,580 per megalitre of water harvested. And if we use an appropriate multiplier, the, we will generate additional national income of $3,600 per megalitre of water diverted. You cannot do that with small scale farming. So my question is, do we allocate water to get that economic benefit to create those jobs, or do we allocate it for political expediency? Because in those isolated areas, Fragmented uh, water allocations really don't create any great economic benefit. They can't create all of the architecture, uh, processing infrastructure and what have you that is needed to create something of real value. We need a change. We need a change in mindset. And th that's the mindset I've been talking about. The size and the scale and the integration. Different than what we've done it ever. We need a change in policy. Water policy, um, we're getting great support from the Queensland Government, but there was no proven or existing pathway uh, for us to prove that we had a great project, that it was sustainable, that it's environmentally okay, and to be allocated water at the end. So we could go through all that 
and there's no pathway to a water allocation, as there is in the resources industry. You know, if you're wanting to start off a coal, move from an exploration permit to a mining permit. There was a pathway. You still had to do the environmental impact studies and what have you, but there was a pathway. There was none. Uh, there was none in this regard. But that development protocol and uh, the negotiations we've been having and the coordinated uh, and the government's willingness to change some of these policies means that we can get there. But there, and, and Peter made reference to land tenure, there's a whole lot of policies out there that really need updating and changing to accommodate new ways of doing things. Regulations, well, no matter what game you're in Australia at present, it's a regulatory nightmare. Um, and we need to continue to look at that, to make it easier, to make it quicker uh, to do things. You've still got to be sustainable, you've still got to do it in a, in a way which, to, which is, um, um, you know, environmentally uh, acceptable. But, gee, some of those regulations go on forever. And finally, incentives. Um, tax, in, uh, obviously I'm talking about tax. Um, we need to look at, um, if, if governments are serious about developing the north and uh, agriculture, we need to look at tax regimes, tax incentives. I mean, uh, David Hassam is here and myself and another three, uh, two or three others. We've put all this money in ourselves so far, the seed funding, and not, and not only, uh, and, and that's all come from after tax income. Uh, we cannot expect to get a return on that for at least six years. Um, we are now out in the market, try well, and, and one of our people, our CEO, he's a 40-year-old, he's, a, um, he's, a he's at the height of his earning power, he's been 18 months now full-time on this project without earning a cent. Uh, you, can imagine, um, you, you can imagine the lack of tranquility in his boudoir these days when he goes home and, and, um, and, and the partner says, well, we wouldn't mind a few, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm talking money. <laughs> they, uh, um, and now we're out trying to raise 15 million. That's, I call that venture capital. It's, it's, it's fairly high risk. This has never been done before. It's a green field. Everybody gets a bit cynical. Um, but again, there are no incentives for people, no, no tax incentives. Now, there's lots of ones that have been tried in the past. Um, we could really suggest them. I won't go into them now. But tax incentives for that early stage, high risk patient capital is absolutely necessary. Although, where well on the way to doing it without it. But I mean, if you want more of these and so forth, and, and governments are serious about the development, and all of the benefits that flow from it, they need to look at some tax incentives. So in every way, I'll finish where I started. If we do what we always did, we'll get what we always got. There is another way of doing it. Thank you.